Many thanks for staying with us here on news. There's to some security issues now. And today is the deadline to the ultimatum given by the Abudus uh, family of Dagbon to go ahead and prepare the Igbewa Palace to conduct the final funeral rites of their late attention has mounted up in the area since they served notice of their intention, with the Andani family organizing a press conference to state that they would defend themselves against any attacks from the latter should they come near the palace. Now, security at the Bewa Palace has since been intensified to avert any possible clashes between the rival factions. Security analyst Imano Suwati has been shedding some light on development so far uh, on the AM show. What do they say I should come? So why can't I sacrifice that you do it? My son or my great-grandson can become a king one day. So what is the problem with that? Mm. I really find it very difficult that they cannot sit down. You don't need eminent chiefs to come and solve this problem. You don't need government to solve this problem. It's within the Dogbon themselves. Well, Who should see that? Apparently, they can't solve it among themselves. They so have to. If they could, they, they would have solved it. How do you by solve now. it for them? But don't worry, we no, have on the no, line. No, no, how you solve NS it for them? So at it. Uh, he's a security expert. Uh, a very good morning to you. Um, you're, not morning, you're, you're not good worried morning, about the Apple security <laughs> experts, are you? No, 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 no. My credentials speak for myself. Fantastic. My I... last position was a T5 in the UN system. Well, that's I'm okay. That's okay. And as I'm very, and as I'm very familiar with you, though, this is Roland, Roland Walker, and I know that. Uh, uh, we've been, we've known each other for a very long time, and um, yeah, at least for yeah. seventeen years. I think seventeen years. Yes, um, it's enough to have the work. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and anyway, but I don't uh, mind. But let me add a caveat. I don't mind if you call me an analyst, a commentator. It doesn't matter to me. The fact of the matter. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> anyway, but, but but let me just run this by you. You've had a, a number of experiences, and I've I've also talked to you a number of times uh, alongside a number of um, the people you've worked with in achieving your academic credentials, etc. And also based on your experiences working in the sub region, do you think that as a country we could have better resolved this than the way uh, we we went through uh, this uh, the last fourteen years, so to speak? Yeah, it's always better to prevent. You know, prevention is always the key and do it. Mm. And I think that then, when I think then, uh, before that particular conflict, I think the early warning signs were there. And I think with a hindsight, because we always have the advantage of hindsight, and um, we could have done it better. And talking about better, it also means that we have to l draw a lot of lessons from early warning, gathering the active who bring the early warnings, how you break the warnings, and the relevant actors that they're able to piece together, weave together in terms of their knowledge, their social network, their social capital to make sure that in other theaters, one you prevent and then when it has happened, you try to mitigate the factors and then try to look for sustainable solutions. Now, each of these phases, each referring to the prevention, the management and sustainable peace, um, if it's a continuum, takes a long time depending on the nature of the violence in terms of the casualty, what people perceive to have happened in terms of perception. You know, perception and reality are almost treated the same in conflict. Most and for me, with my experience, I'm even more afraid of perceptions and rumor than the reality. So then if you're able to deal with these um, issues to an extent with the um, willing heart from, from warring factions and, and, and the eagerness of, of other actors to support, you try to have some peace, and then over time, you can sustain that peace. Because if you're not careful in sustaining that peace through the buy-in of those involved, mm. as the man there was saying, it is the people of Dagomba who have run with it. We will just provide the facilitating conditions. Exactly. We referring to the artists oh outside um, Dagomba. And I'm putting all of us together, although we are different constituencies. I'm just putting non-Dagomba together, um, supporting Dagomba to make sure that where we need just um, that is sensitive to our tradition, we do that. Where we need um, some form of reconciliation, we do that. The problem has always been, and it's an enduring feature in certain types of conflict. Do you bring um, reconciliation before justice or justice before reconciliation? It's a conundrum that can never be solved. It's mm, but it's not as, as simple as that, is it? Saying that, well, they have to go or do a lot more introspection and see that well, these conflicts are not good for us, and so we we'll want to resolve our differences. Um, no, you see, but what I wanted to add, what, what I wanted to add is, for the fact that, let's say, governments, whether the, the political government, whether it's an MPP or an NDC, who feel that 
um, we don't want to meddle in chieftaincy. And as a result of that, there's always this uh, lukewarm, um, as if hot and cold attitude towards resolving it, and so leaving it to the protagonist to resolve. Doesn't it kind of accentuate or perpetuate or consolidate the conflict? You see, it is not, um, I'm going to put it in another way. It is not always true or necessarily true that chieftaincy conflicts do not have a heavy dose of um, and politics. Mm. What happens is that the interventions escalate depending on the theater. So I'll give you an example. You see that let this chieftaincy, we don't use the what you call primogenitor, you know, the first time necessarily becomes the king. You have a number of pre qualified royals. Mm -hmm. And that is situated within the context of our fast evolving traditions because our traditions always evolve and it is not unique to Ghana or peculiar or distinct to us. It is a common denominator that you see around the world in terms of how traditions and, and tactics evolve. Okay, so we have a number of pre qualified royals, and it gets to a time that those pre qualified royals would want to become chief or, 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 um, or king, depending on the context. Okay. Then you need some level of gravitas. You need your social network. The social network can be religious, can be political. When I say religious, traditional religion and how the key actors in certain positions would have to support and influence your desire to become a chief and maybe represent a particular thing. So there are those contestations. And in the modern state, you, what you need is the state resources on your side by design or default. So, for example, you realize that of the time. No matter the scale of chieftaincy conflict you have in Ghana, you have a ton of, of active partisan politics. The idea is that if you're able to have the ruling party on your side, by extension, you can have a fair handle on the way the state will deal with you. In other words, the worst case scenario in the uh, calculations of these protagonists is that mm. you look the other way, the state will look the other way. Sasha Water producers in the country are considering an increase in prices. Now, the position is born out of the latest increases in petroleum products and utility tariffs. My colleague, Sanamento, is at a media briefing being organized by the Sashi Water Producers Association and joins us live now over the telephone with the latest on this. So, uh, Sanam, good morning. Thanks for your time. Now, uh, tell us what has been happening this morning. Okay, you're saying that the rates, um, the tariff rates have really increased and it's discriminatory. One and two, it promotes the consumption of beverages rather than water because the alcoholic beverages have been increased, but not as much as it has been for the sachet water, which is about 500%. And they're also saying they are killing the Ghanaian entrepreneur, uh, the, the, the businesses of these sachet water producers. And then the new um, rate or the price for sachet water will be 30%. Um, 30 pesos, effective 1st February, and then the track price, that um, the water that's packaged on the track, will be between 4.5 to 5 TD, effective 1st February. And these rates are just based on the fuel prices. So they're just waiting on PRC to um, respond to their cry, and then they'll see what they'll do next. But if they do not respond, then they'll have to increase it again. Okay, so Salam, if I get you correctly, uh, effective February 1, the price of uh, a sachet water is going to go for 30 pesos. That's a 50% increment, right? Okay. Uh, my colleagues and I'm in tow at a particular media briefing, and uh, we'll bring you a lot more on this in subsequent broadcasts. But that's how we wrap up our news desk this morning. My name is Kwabna Chen Chen Boateng. There's more news on myjoyonline.com. Coming up next, the join is interactive. Like I said, coming up next is joining us interactive with my colleague Ben Isabu Have a good morning. <laughs>